Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this brave new world for the RAHS. Um, as you might imagine, we had planned a conference last year at Bathurst. We planned a conference this year at Bathurst. We're planning a conference next year at Bathurst. Uh, we will get to Bathurst. The mountains will be crossed. But in the meantime, as Sydney and the rest of Australia opens up gradually, uh, we thought we should continue with the brave new technology we've all been experiencing over the last two years. So welcome very much to our brave new world of life in the 20s and 30s. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce the speakers to you today. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we are meeting today and to pay my respects to their old elders past, present and future. Our first speaker is Scott MacArthur, who's going to talk to us about Australian architecture in the 1920s, building for a healthy new world. We've sort of picked these topics because we've all had more to do with our homes than usual over the last two years. And it seemed important to continue that theme in a historical manner. So um, Scott will look at the aspirational and health aspects of architecture. He's a conservation architect and is currently in his ninth year as president of the Marrickville Heritage Society. Uh, he's a previous winner of the New South Wales Government Heritage Volunteers Award and an RAHS Special Achievement Certificate winner uh, in recognition for the work he has done at Marrickville Heritage Society and championing the built heritage of that area. Um, he is, has retired with an interest in um, the architecture of health. So, Scott. Looking forward to it very much. Thank you very much, Carol, and um, thank you for your acknowledgement of country. Um, I'll now share my screen, which is that one there. Thank you for uh, zooming into my talk. Um, I guess I'm uh, I'm a, a conservation architect and I'm also a retired GP, and um, so I have got a particular interest in. Um, how architecture relates to health and vice versa. Of course, this topic is, is inspired by the past two years of life in Australia with COVID and the relationship and interconnections with our experiences in Australia um, a century ago um, for the pandemic of 1918 and 1919 um, has been brought home uh, by a number of wonderful talks and studies and I just want to sort of uh, build on those studies with how people reacted um, in the, the, the subsequent decades to the, uh, the trauma of the, uh, the particularly 1919 influenza epidemic. Because I'm from the Marrickville Heritage Society, I'm going to try and reference our area as, as many times as I can. And um, our society put out some um, very good publications um, along with other people working in our area, uh, particularly Chris Meader, uh, looking at the effects of the uh, influenza epidemic in, uh, in Marrickville. The worst of the epidemic um, was over by 1919 and there were no deaths at all from influenza in 1920. And the reasons for this sudden sort of removal of the, the danger of the epidemic, influenza epidemic, has, has not really been well explained. But it meant that discussions about um, healthy buildings and um, health, particularly health um, institutions like hospitals and dormitories associated with institutions didn't really discuss influenza as a, a problem. There was ongoing discussion about diseases like diphtheria and particularly tu tuberculosis. And a lot, of the a lot of the discussion around healthy buildings was more in relation to tuberculosis than it was to, um, to influenza, influenza or the risk of influenza returning. As a consequence, there was a great expectation um, focusing on um, opening up 
um, those words, and affluence um, in the 1920s. As we know, the Roaring Twenties became a symbol of, um, of freedom um, and adventure. And architecture in Australia uh, was generally quite rich and varied uh, from, the, from the beginning of the 1920s. So there were numbers of styles and they were uh, architectural styles and they were expressed with great skill and in some cases um, expense. Um, uh, so I'm just going to cover some of those uh, period styles of the, of the, particularly the early 1920s. So some of our grandest buildings um, were built in Sydney and the, the major capitals and particularly uh, the commercial uh, buildings were, were quite grand um, as, the, as the economy recovered from the, um, the ravages of pandemic and, and world war. So the, one of the grandest buildings in Sydney and perhaps Australia is the um, former government savings bank in Martin Place, 48 Martin Place, uh, which is a um, interwar Beaux-Arts commercial palazzo, absolutely luxuriously appointed, a beautiful building. Similarly, a, a demonstration of, uh, of civic power and, and wealth, the Brisbane City Hall completed in 1929, a Victorian composition, um, academic classical interwar, um, lovely um, stone detailing, um, and on the right is um, a, mod a, a um, installation as part of the, uh, the, 2000, the 2010 uh, restoration works. At the other end of the scale, um, domestic housing drew inspiration from international themes. This is um, May Gibbs Nutcote, uh, of course, in, in North Sydney um, by BJ Waterhouse, uh, Interwar Mediterranean, um, a delightful small composition um, with, with med Mediterranean features of the arc arches and the uh, uh, stucco walls. And towards the end of the, 20s and going into the 30s, fantastic uh, interwar uh, art deco buildings um, exemplified by uh, Emil Söderstern's work. Uh, this is at the uh, former City Mutual Life building uh, in Hunter Street. So there was, this, so there was a lot of uh, building activity, particularly in the commercial and entertainment spheres. But in the uh, health area, a lot of the buildings um, were uh, repurposed um, or extended from their Edwardian and even Victorian um, origins. And particularly um, at places like the Coast Hospital, which by the late, 20, late 1920s was the largest hospital in New South Wales. Um, the main wards um, were built in, uh, during World War II, towards the end of World War II, the flower wards. And while they uh, had um, uh, good natural ventilation, uh, they, they were not really suited to the advances um, of uh, 20th, 20th century medicine that were just um, emerging, particularly overseas. But quite early in um, the 1920s, people began to realise that the nature of buildings for institutions would have to change. And this is the um, Masonic School um, at Balcom Heights in, in Borkham Hills. The first building um, that was established for the school was, is a Georgian revival building um, with typically small uh, square frame windows, uh, a very sort of closed building. But um, even five years later for the dormitories, they were, look, they were looking at um, better ventilation and access to the, to the outdoors. So there were um, these uh, beautiful verandas, uh, windows, um, all operable windows with cross ventilation, uh, and this starting to acknowledge the fact that the Australian experience was going to have to be lived outdoors as well as indoors. Uh, this is a, a, an interesting building that um, and now has been uh, partially refurbished for a, a lot of community uses, um, and now and also a museum for the Hills District Historical Society. So I hope this some people from the, the hills are watching in here. So the development of health architecture in particular was inspired by what was happening overseas. 20th century advancements in uh, medical technology and treatments would require hospital design to radically change. 
And in fact, it became a symbol of a modern and healthy society. This is um, embodied in the evolution of the design language of hospital buildings by Arthur Stevenson and his architectural firms, um, Stevenson and Meldrum, and then Stevenson and Turner, um, Melbourne based, but um, uh, designed and built um, a lot of buildings, very important hospital buildings uh, and other buildings in Sydney. In fact, Robin Boyd wrote in his book, Victorian Modern, hospitals gave modern architecture in Australia its first big break. So they were the first expression of um, functional modest modernism in Australia. Arthur Stevenson was a student of modern architecture um, and early in the, in the mid 1920s, he went overseas and did an American study tour to find out what was happening in um, hospital design where all of the technology um, was being um, developed in, in the United States. But then in the 90, early 1930s, um, he went to Europe um, where the, um, the modernists, the, um, Le Corbusier and uh, Marcel Breuer, were working at Bauhaus to create a, a, a new form of architecture, um, the, the modernist um, idiom. And he was particularly impressed um, with the tuberculosis sanatorium um, in Finland by Alva Arto. Alva Arto. He saw, uh, Stevenson saw this as a, an exemplar for what architecture should be. Alva Alvarado used the building as a, as part of the treatment of, of the of the patients. They were they were because there was no known cure for uh, tuberculosis at that stage. Alto saw it as a medical instrument, um, so that there would be. Uh, limited numbers of patients per room, there was extensive balconies, um, th there was areas for people to um, uh, have community meetings. It was designed to um, improve the health and the mental uh, health of the people that were in there. When Stevenson uh, returned to Australia, uh, he was um, inspired by this and uh, developed a, a, probably a dozen buildings um, in, in the major capitals uh, that reflected this same um, philosophy. Stevenson described the, um, the sanatorium as the way to express in its simplest form the function of the building in the most appropriate material. So there was that joining of, of materials and the function, uh, which was the hallmark of functionalist architecture. And so you can see here the, um, uh, the external balconies and some um, of the uh, patients enjoying the view over the, uh, the finished landscape. So as Stevenson, um, and turn, Stevenson returned to Australia and started working on uh, buildings from the, the mid thirties that reflected um, Alto's philosophy and the other European architects. Um, here there's, um, this is Gloucester House at uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital from 1936. Uh, so this is demonstrating um, the, the, an Art Deco flavour, but, but um, more linear um, and looking again at extensive areas of glazing. One of the next major projects that he worked on was at the King George V Hospital. Uh, this was a, a building that was almost, it was instantly acknowledged as a classic. Um, it was uh, given the Salmon um, Award for Public Architecture um, by the Institute of Architects in 1941. Um, importantly, as well as the, the functional attributes of the, the, um, the building, there's inclusion of um, art and art elements um, in sculpture all through the building, uh, which again was addressing the role of the, the building as um, a, uh, an element in the, in the health, the mental health uh, and well-being of the people that were, were in the building. One of, their, one of their greatest works um, was the uh, Urala Military Hospital at Con Concord. This wasn't completed until 1940, but again, um, it was uh, designed to um, foster good health. There was uh, access to light um, and fresh air. And again, this, this building was in incredibly successful, was also awarded a, um, a Solman Memorial Prize for Architecture. 
So the main thing that we're at, we can take away, I think, from um, arch arch art and architecture in the 1920s um, and 1930s in Australia is that it was developed in response to a healing intention. It expressed um, the, the modernity of the time, uh, but also reflected the austerity, the relative austerity of healthcare um, at those times. So that there was uh, the new, de new developments in, in managing healthcare. The federal government took a much greater role after the pandemic, um, but still the, the um, expenditure and budgets um, for health were not really enough to enable buildings to be as decorated or ebullient um, as in the commercial and entertainment spheres. And certainly the uh, health architecture became the cutting edge and the, um, the opening for functionalist modern, modernism in Australia and led to the, the post-war work of people like, like Harry Seidler, particularly in a domestic and commercial sphere. Yes, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, um, Scott, very interesting. We do have one question. So uh, it's from Peter Hobbins and he writes, great presentation, Scott. I've noticed that face, I've noticed that um, facies, I think it's pronounced. Um, it's the, the Roman, um, the thing that they use to whip people, I think it is, is that right? The yeah. Fasces, uh, yeah. Yep. yeah, the Roman cluster of branches tied together, um, the sim a symbol of fascist Italy. Um, feature he's seen that these feature in the Sydney Deco buildings. Um, was this motive intended to convey a sense of utility, uh, so unity and communal strength? Uh, do you see it as a symbol of modern and healthy society, uh, as you noted from other architectural design features of this period? I, uh, the Fascus is um, an interesting. Um, motif. Um, I, I think it had, I think it must have that sort of um, community um, conjoining meaning. I think there, the, there is an association also with a, um, an authoritarian connection. Um, but I think the largest fascist um, in maybe the world um, is the, um, the, the, flagpole at um, Parliament House in Canberra, um, which is obviously meant as a symbol of, uh, of uh, union um, with the four, four stainless steel legs surmounting to a, a flagpole uh, with the flared base at the bottom of the pole. Um, so I guess it's multi, uh, uh, multi-valued um, and I think people, uh, but in a positive sense, people associated associated it as a um, as a conjoining rather than um, a, a um, uh, compelling um, union. Um, yeah, Joanna has a question and asks: uh, Did the Yarralara Yarralara? Apologies if I pronounce anything incorrectly today. Sorry, everybody. Uh, did the Yarralara Military Hospital become Concord Repatriation Hospital? It did. It was. It was. Um, the the whole complex was in, initially uh, referred to as the uh, repatriation hospital, and then Urala repatriation repatriation hospital. Then became Concord. Um, I'm not sure when. Sometime after the uh, the war, I think in the late forties or early early fifties. Um, Robin asks, uh, are most of these buildings still standing and used today? If so, have they been significantly changed and modernised? I think all of the buildings that I showed um, are still extant. Um, a lot of them I chose because I've worked on them at some stage, um, the Australian ones anyway. Um, they, be, the, because they were robustly built, um, a lot of them have um, been adaptively reused um, or um, uh, updated uh, to to current um, stand standards. Um, I thought I thought the um, Balcom um, Estate. Um, Balcom Heights estate buildings being reused for a whole lot of community uh, groups was really really good. Um, the uh, 
King George the Fifth is now used as uh, administration, um, even though it was built for to cater for 20th century technology. It probably wasn't built to cater for 21st century technology, um, and so it's it's been repurposed for administration. Um, and certainly the the uh, 48 Martin Place building and the 66 Hunter. Um, are both um, being used as office buildings um, and uh, in the case of the Commonwealth, the, the um, former Commonwealth Bank, it's still got a Commonwealth Bank um, presence, but also Macquarie Bank now owns it. Uh, so because they're robust and, and almost all designed by um, architects um, of, of high reputation, um, they've stood the test of time and they're, yes, they're, they're almost all used still. And just a follow up question from Robin, um, are many of the of these buildings listed as heritage? Again, um, I think I think all of them are um, that we, we looked at that I looked at here today. Um, most a lot of them are state heritage listed um, buildings like the, uh, the Commonwealth Bank are worthy of um, acknowledgement at a national level because they are extraordinary buildings of high quality and um, uh, quality finishes um, and uh, Balcom Heights Estate even though it's not a um, not built by a, a famous builder or architect um, is listed as a conservation area and is actually I think owned yes it's owned by um, the Hillshire Council uh, and, and well maintained so we're very lucky that these buildings are, 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 all, are all protected. Carol sent, submitted a question and uh, Carol would like to know in what ways would building design for tuberculosis be different to that needed for influenza? They'd be very similar. Um, the, um, the I think the, the main difference with tuberculosis is that uh, it, it's a um, disease of, of long standing. Um, at the time that they were treating the, the tuberculosis, people wouldn't get um, dramatically sick and die from it usually. Um, they would have to be cared for in institution for long periods of time. Uh, whereas influenza, um, there you were when the pandemic was particularly strong, the infection was virulent um, and people um, would have been... Um, saved or not quite quickly. There would have been uh, a lot of movement of people in and out of wards. Um, so they wouldn't be having to be catered for um, in, in the long term. And I think that meant that as, as um, Alva Alto um, provided uh, for, there were areas for people to get together to, to sort of um, create and foster communities in the institution. Um, the, the baseline requirements for ventilation and light um, would have been similar, but I think it's that it's that aspect of um, community that would have was would ha would have to be added to um, an institution that was uh, treating tuberculosis or those long term like long term infections. Krista's um, submitted a question and I uh, would like to know what was the attitude to windows and fresh air. And uh, now, just part of a question she's written about. Um, the Nightingale nursing methods that valued fresh air, and so did her grandmother's uh, 1913 home science notes. Uh, fresh, air, fresh air was seen to be um, one of the key components of, of um, health and healing, um, along with light. Um, and I, the, I think the, it, it stemmed from that fear of the miasma um, that was a sort of all-encompassing disease vector um, in, the, I think, in the, um, the Victorian era uh, and perhaps earlier. So the, the removal of miasma, um, the, uh, the encouragement of, of fresh air was, was seen as uh, particularly important for, um, uh, for health um, and, and caring for, for, the, for the sick. Um, the and the the um, uh, the idea that um, keeping the air moving would somehow dispel um, infection uh, and the, the miasma um, was uh, was fairly well established in in healthcare, um, but the 
but certainly with influenza, there was no idea what was actually causing the infection. Um, and it was, a, uh, it was empirical that fresh air um, was, imp was of importance. Hmm. Last question from Richard. How were these buildings received at the time? Was there excitement, outrage? Well, I, I think the, um, certainly the uh, Stevenson and Turner buildings, um, both of them um, receiving um, Sulman Awards, um, was a sort of emphatic um, uh, acceptance by the architectural community. Um, I think there was, I think there was some resistance um, as to all functional modernist buildings. Um, but I, but from the, the, the way that functional modernism um, propagated into other areas of, of the, the built environment, um, like particularly um, churches and schools, um, I think demonstrates how um, it, it became accepted by uh, the wider community as, as outside of the architectural community. Um, as um, a, an expression of of modernness, um, of uh, you know, of currency, um, and uh, and support from institutions, including the government, um, for um, for social social benefits. So I, I think it represented that, and people accepted it for that. Thank you, Sky, and thank you for a very interesting presentation.